that so that we can all uh, listen to this tomorrow. People that were signed up, we had about 180 people sign up, um, which was cool. Hi, everybody. Hi, Dolores. Hi, Caitlin. Awesome. Cool. All right. So can everyone see um, the PowerPoints? Good. Okay, cool. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. So tonight we're going to be talking about herbal first aid, which can be a huge topic. So some of the things that I was thinking about when I was writing the class to make it as accessible as I could for everybody is really kind of think about the primary things that show up again and again around the house um, within all types of households, um, people with kids, without kids, um, small families, big families, um, what shows up regularly and consistently in human beings and what have I seen most frequently um, in first aid situations um, come up. And then also, I really wanted to focus on herbs that are either accessible across the board in wild places nearby, no matter where you live, or herbs that are incredibly accessible via the grocery store. Um, so one of my big important things is I really want to make herbalism accessible for people. Um, and I don't want to teach about obscure herbs or herbs that are really hard to find. Um, I really like to teach about herbs and herbal medicine that's accessible, easy to find, easy to use, safe, um, and, you know, there's a place for more heroic herbalism. There's a place for more advanced clinical style herbalism. And I love that. I'm trained in that. And I use that regularly. Um, but for the scope of you guys, I think it's really important to make sure that you know that you can be incredibly effective with common everyday things that you have full access to. So that's kind of what we're going to do. Everyday herbalism for common complaints. So tonight we're going to be talking about cuts and scrapes, bug bites, pink eye, digestive sluggishness, UTIs, constipation, coughs, colds, and flus, and anxiety and sleep. These are easily addressed with the herbs that I'm going to talk about tonight. Obviously, there are concurrent conditions um, more serious things, but as a general rule, if these things are just cropping up occasionally once a year, um, for UTI, um, constipation, when you travel, um, you know, pink eye, because you hung out with your nephew who's in preschool, you know, these things are not going to be coming up regularly. If you are struggling with them regularly, these herbs will work, but there needs to be an address addressing common, um, you know, the more serious underlying possible causes. So yeah, so this is kind of the rundown of tonight. We're going to cover, um, we're going to do a hello. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, we're going to, uh, discuss common things for first aid. So we're going to talk about uh, a couple of plants, plantain, wild cherry, violet, chamomile, ginger, and usnea. We're going to talk about important dosages are one of the most important things that we will cover tonight. It's, I don't know how many times I see people, um, they express that they tried an herb and I asked them the dosage and they just, they either took way too small amount or they did not take it consistently enough, or they didn't take it at a proper interval. Um, so those are all important things to know for each plant. So we're going to kind of cover and go over those and then also talk a little bit about um, the best way to get that plant into you. So it could be a tea, a tincture, a salve. Um, for however, whatever concern or condition we're talking about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about important first aid skills as far as, you know, the best way to make a herbal infusion decoction, what a poultice and compress is, 
properly preparing herbs. We're going to talk about first aid kits and I have my personal first aid kit and we're going to talk about that. And then um, we're going to talk about what you should include in your personal first aid kit, tips for assembling a kit that meets the needs of your family or, or you, um, and then resources for purchasing and making herbal first aid kits. Then we're going to talk about, we're going to do a little recap, takeaways, Q&A, and then um, talk a little bit about other ways to learn from me and uh, resources and programs that I offer. So who am I? I am a clinical functional herbalist. I have a BS in biology with an environmental studies minor. I graduated from multiple herb schools. I took classes with Daryl Patton at the Southeastern Institute for Traditional Herbal Studies when I was in college. Um, that was 2010. I uh, joined Thomas at the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine, Thomas Easley, um, in 2012. I have a level one certified aromatherapy certificate um, from the New York Institute of Aromatic Studies. I'm a registered herbalist, so that's a credential. Um, I uh, It's credentialed through the American uh, Herbalist Guild. So if you see the initials behind my name, I'm an RH. Um, I have nine years of clinical experience. I've seen over 700 people in clinic. Um, and I have 14 years of training. I have about 4,000 hours of study. The only reason I know that is because I have to write it all out for the, um, my registered herbalist certification. So I've been doing this a long time. I know I look green, um, but I have a lot of experience and, um, and I'm happy to share it with you here. So now I'm director and uh, primary teacher for the Deep Roots School of Foraging and Herbal Medicine. And if you don't know about the school, you should check it out. So we're gonna talk about these plants, these super common remedies. So the first plant that we're gonna talk about is plantain. Um, and if you're familiar with this plant, I would love to get a little nod in the, the chat if you've ever used this plant. Um, it is ubiquitous. It can be found on every single continent. Um, I've run into it in Turkey. Um, I it's, it's a lovely plant and it's really easy to identify. So if you can look at the identifying characteristics, we have, um, what's called parallel leaf venation. So these two plants that are, are on the screen um, are related. They're both plantain. One is Plantago major, one is Plantago lanceolata. The one that's shaped like a lance shaped leaf um, is lanceolata. Plantago major has the more circular round shaped leaves. Um, and they both have this spike life uh, flower arrangement, and um, and they're both used interchangeably. There are other varieties. Um, it looks like most everybody is local, like in Alabama, some people um, in the Southeast, uh, one person from Chicago, um, but there are a couple of other varieties that grow around here. My favorite one to harvest and, and forage for is Plantago rugelii. It's massive. The leaves are like the size of my palm. Um, so it's a quick, easy harvest, but these are out right now. I, um, highly recommend exploring and finding them. Um, but they're very easy to identify once you know what you're looking for. So this plant in particular, it really shines as a, a topical plant for cuts and scrapes and bug bites. It has a really interesting profile in that it is simultaneously astringent. So that means that it, it pulls and draws things out. Um, astringency is a property that basically you, you have um, tannins hit the tissue and then start coalescing anything that's on top of it. It starts binding proteins and kind of glomming things together. So we've got astringency. It also pulls out things like splinters or venom. Um, tannins uh, bind um, alkaloids and alkaloids are venom. Very commonly, any, any venom that 
uh, any insect and or snake produces are alkaloids. They're alkaloidal. And so tannins will um, are kind of the primary thing that we use to neutralize um, venoms. And so that's one of the really amazing things about plantain is that it has this astringency. At the same time, plantain also has this great demulcency. Demulcent means that it is soothing, moistening, and mucilaginous and goopy. So it's kind of an interesting combination to have something be drying and tannic and also soothing and mucil mucinat mucilaginous. <laughs> um, and then we also have this great property where we have this constituent in plantain um, called a lantwin. And the lantwin is found in comfrey and it's also found in breast milk and a couple other plants, but a lantwin actually increases cellular replication um, and it increases how quickly cells reproduce. So it will heal wounds more rapidly, um, which is a really, it, I mean, when you think about the things that happen in a trauma wound or a bite or a scrape or a cut, we want astringency to draw out that poison or pull out a splinter. We want to soothe it if in the case of a burn or a scrape or a cut, and we want to heal it faster, vulnerary. So that is why you see plantain as being one of the primary plants that people talk about use um, for, um, for wound healing. Now, Alantoin, primarily this main constituent that increases cellular replication is water soluble. So when you put it in a salve, it doesn't work as well, which is why most people will talk about doing spit poultices with this plant. If that grosses you out, okay, I'll back up. A spit poultice, you grab the leaf, you chew it up, or you put it in your hand and you spit and you grind it up until like in a little ball until you start to see that your saliva turns green because you're starting to extract the plant material. And then you plop that right on your bite. Um, it works amazingly well like that because it extracts best in water and your saliva is mostly water. Um, when you start extracting it as a, um, as a salve, it works fine. And it, it's, you know, it's B plus, like it's fine. You're going to get, it's going to be really effective. It's going to be great for, um, other issues like bruises and insect bites, and it makes it more portable. Um, but you're really like, it's best when used fresh in a fresh poultice. If, if doing a spit poultice grosses you out, you just pour water in your hand and then do the same thing and grind up the leaves, kind of like a mortar and pestle in your hand. Um, another, so some other things that plantain is used for, if you think about the, a wound on the outside of the body, you can also utilize it for wounds on the inside of the body. So if you think about gut and digestive related illness, where we have tissue degradation, um, in things like IBSD, IBSC, we've got um, gut permeability when we've got um, issues with um, uh, gut tissue being open, and we've got um, you know leaky gut showing up. Any instances of like a stomach ulcer, I use plantain almost all the time um, in any type of tea or extract that I'm doing for anybody with gut inflammation, irritation, um, or a, a wound of some type. So that's really um, important. Um, Matthew asked, you said that it helps with alkaloids. Did that also work for an overdose of comfrey? Could you reframe that question, Matthew? Do you mean that when in cases where people have taken too much comfrey and they have liver damage from perilazidine alkaloids, or do you mean something else? Okay. Yeah. So, um, liver damage caused by PAs is not going to be addressed well, um, mm, mm, mm. by the time they get to your liver, it's kind of too late. Um, if, 
if you take P, if you take a plant, I mean, PA is also like, you just shouldn't be ingesting comfrey. Um, if you're ingesting comfrey regularly and repetitively, you're going to cause liver damage. And then that's, um, like long-term, you're going to have to address liver damage from that, um, in a more long-term way. When we're talking about alkaloids, alkaloidal, um, compounds tend to have to be quick acting and they have a really short half-life. So like, if you think about things like coffee or nicotine, they hit us really quick, they're metabolized rapidly, and then they're excreted. Um, if you don't take an alkaloid with a tannin immediately, it won't bind it and inactivate it. So once someone has damaged their liver with comfrey, they have liver damage because the PAs have already done the damage and then been excreted. Um, does that make sense? I hope so. That's a lot of like liver metabolism and contraindications and all that, but, um, but great question. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we've addressed and talked about gut wounds and gut inflammation and gut, um, uses of planting. And then we've got, um, it's great for coughs, um, and getting sticky phlegm out of the lungs. So you remember me talking about plantain and how it has astringency and how astringent things, tannins will bind proteins. One of the things that happens when you drink plantain tea or anything astringent is you immediately start getting kind of this mucusy feel in your throat and you want to hack up mucus or blow your nose because it's glommed all the mucus together and gotten it off of your tissue and then made a big ball of it. And your body's like, oh, that's well packaged time to get that out of here. And so then you start excreting it. So you end up like clearing your throat, gooping up, like everything gets really like goopy and like you just feel snotty and then you start sneezing, coughing, getting all that stuff out. A lot of times we get phlegm just gunked on the inside of our lungs. That's what happens when we get infections. All we get an infection in the alveoli of our lungs um, or whatever part of the lungs we're addressing. Um, it can be upper respiratory or lower respiratory. Um, but when we get all of that phlegm in there, we can take plantain, the tannins in the plantain help to glom up all of that mucus. And then we excrete it really well. Um, it, it works really well with a plant called Grindelia. I also really like it. Grindelia is for really specifically for stuck mucus. I also really like it with populus, um, tremuloides poplar buds. Um, and, uh, it's really neat. Poplar buds, actually you, you eat them, like you can just chew on a bud and then immediately start excreting, um, the, some of the constituents via your lungs. So you just like immediately have minty breath. Um, it's much like garlic where you ingest the garlic and it's metabolized in the lungs through the lungs. So you eat it, it's digested. And then it, you start breathing out Allison. That's why it works so effectively because it's not that common for plants to be excreted and for the metabolites to be excreted via the lungs. Uh, it can be kind of hard to get things to the lungs. So when you're working with the lungs, really knowing how things are metabolized and excreted, it can be really helpful. Um, but so poplar buds, grindelia, garlic, they all go through the lungs. Um, they all have metabolites that are excreted via the lungs. Um, let's see, as a tea, we're going to do 15 grams of plant material to one quart of water. It's really important that you get a scale and you weigh your plant material because a lot of times, um, we see people just doing like a tea bag full, which is like that much. And it's just not enough herb to be therapeutic and to, to do, to do what you're wanting it to do. Um, so in order to get a therapeutic intervention, um, you really have to take the most, like the appropriate amount of this plant. Um, let's see, uh, just to back up a little bit to talk about, can y'all see my cursor? Okay, good. 
Um, so parts used in degree of remedy, this is a first to second degree remedy. That means it's really safe. We have first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree. First degree is food. Second degree is spice. You should think about it like food. Think about it like spice. Think about it like medicine. Think about it like low-dose botanical. So that means something toxic or something really heroic like a pharmaceutical. You should think about it like a pharmaceutical. So if I say something is a first or second degree remedy, that means that you can dose higher, you can take it for longer in a general as a general way of speaking. And a lot of times you can eat them um, like chickweed in a salad. So um, yeah, so plantain is a first to second degree remedy. As a tincture, you would harvest the fresh leaf, make a one to two, that's one part herb to two parts, sorry, one part, um, yes, one part herb to two parts extract, and then do 95% alcohol, take two to five milliliters up to four times a day. As a glycerin-based extract, fresh leaf, I really like plantain juiced. Um, I think it works amazingly well, and it's a really neat way to do it. Uh, so I like to do fresh plantain juice. Um, and or just blend plantain up in the blender with glycerin and then strain it. Um, fresh plantain. As a salve, you do dried leaf one to four um, and you can use an oil to make a salve for topical use. Distinguishing characteristics, we talked about the, the parallel leaf inhalation. Um, I think it's important to talk about um, it has a basal rosette. So that means all of the leaves come out from the one point at the bottom of the plant where it attaches to the ground. So you've got roots and plant coming up just like that. It's not like a stem and then the leaves come out up the stem. So a basal rosette is something to look for. And then uh, common lookalikes, showy orchis maybe, or hosta family, but both of those like shade. So you're, you're like, Plantain will grow pretty much anywhere. It really does like full sun and waste places and like fields and yards and anywhere that's cut. Um, so like I said, you can really find this almost anywhere. You can use, I wanna make sure I'm addressing UTIs. You can use plantain for UTIs as part of a formula to help soothe, tighten and tone tissue in the bladder. I just wanna make sure I'm covering all my, all my first aid bases. Ginger, everyone loves ginger. It's the best. Um, I think some really important things to note about ginger is the essential oil is one of the primary active constituents in ginger. The essential oil is held inside of the tissue in little vesicles. The best way to get the essential oil out of it is to get one of those ginger plates and rub the ginger on it. You can also shred it, but if you're just slicing ginger up like with a knife, it's really hard to get it. Um, you're not getting the most out of your ginger. Um, I like, you can buy a microplaner if you wanna be snooty about it. I really like the little ginger plates. They just have like little teeny tall, like um, little teeny spikes on it and you just rub the ginger on it and then it kind of shreds it a little bit. And that really gets you all of the chemical constituents, the uh, active constituents. Um, I love fresh ginger grated. I think it's incredible. Um, I think ginger juice is really effective. I think when you start to cook ginger, um, you get less activity and you start to see degradation of anti-inflammatory constituents. So I think that's just important to note. Um, if you can juice it or blend it, um, uh, it still works great as a tea. I think that it helps to mellow it, especially for children. Um, but I tend to do like, I do garlic, lemon, um, ginger lemonade, and I put it all in the blender, a whole lemon blanch. So you get the wax off the lemon. And then I just throw a whole piece of ginger 
and then I add a couple cloves of garlic and then I blend it all up and then I, and then I strain it and then I put a whole bunch of honey in it and then I give it to my toddler. Um, you always got to gauge your kids to see how much ginger they'll do, but that's what we do when we're sick. Um, and it works amazingly well. Um, it is analgesic. It is much more analgesic when it is fresh. Anti-emetic, so it's anti-nausea. Um, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but I have found, and I have found clinically, that sometimes warming things are not what you want when you've puked. And I think that if people, if it's like, I think there are cases where ginger is really specifically indicated in like cases of, um, I think menstrual related, like digestive upset, I think pregnancy, I don't know. It's kind of a toss up. Sometimes people just don't want ginger. My alternatives for that when they want something more cooling OSHA is incredibly anti-nausea. Um, and then I actually like lobelia in small doses, which is odd because it's called pukeweed and it'll make you throw up if you have too much, but it's really great to kind of settle the stomach. And I've used that, um, with my daughter, Ren, um, in cases where like, I don't know if this has ever happened to you guys where you, you puke. And then your body like gets in a mode and you're like, I'm just going to puke all night. Like, that's just what we're going to do. There's nothing in my stomach. There's no reason to be puking. I'm just puking. Um, and, uh, lobelia will kind of help suppress that. Um, I really like ginger for increasing stomach acid and replenishing stomach acid rapidly, which is a lot of times why you end up throwing up multiple times because you'll end up with just saliva and fluid in your stomach, but no stomach acid to process it. And so that's why people end up throwing up a lot. You just throw up stomach contents and like slobber. Ugh, I'm starting to get the weeds. But um, so, you know, using ginger um, and then also thinking about those other plants that I mentioned. It is incredibly aromatic. It's carminative. Carminative means that it will um, help you process gas in your gut. So what's interesting about carminatives is it actually helps you process and digest um, and excrete gas from your gut through your lungs more readily, which is really interesting. Um, so, and I'm not just like making that up um, to be like a shocker. Um, there's actually stool tests and, and cultures that they do the way that you discover whether you have high amounts of metha, methane bacteria, methanobacteria in your gut in order to diagnose, um, really specific gut issues is they do a breath test. So they'll have you breathe out. And if you breathe out a bunch of methane, then you have high amounts of methanobacteria. So carminatives the herb helps upregulate how much gas you're excreting from your gut into your lungs and out. Um, so pretty interesting. Uh, counter irritant. So this is topically ginger is a counter irritant, meaning like in situations and instances where the joint, you have joint pain and it's irritated and it's hot and it's upset. You can distract your nerve endings by putting something warm on them. So that's is exactly how like Asper cream works. Not only is it anti-inflammatory, but it distracts the nerve endings and makes it to where your, your whole nervous system and your pain signaling system is distracted by the heat. And so ginger can be a counter irritant. Um, Let's see, diaphoretic, it will help you sweat out a fever. I love a ginger bath. You can juice ginger and then put it in the bath. You have to do a small amount though. Do like a half ounce of juice. Um, 
let's see, digestive tonic. It's great. You can literally just take ginger every day before your meals, like drink ginger tea, do ginger juice. It's amazing. Um, it's one of the best things to do for coughs and colds. As soon as you start feeling it, do juice ginger. I can never do it straight. I always dilute it with either carrot or lemon, um, some celery, whatever you need to like get a, a pretty solid amount of ginger juice in. Um, it's a great circulatory stimulant. It particularly shines as an anti-infective and an anti-inflammatory and anti-emetic. Um, let's see, other tidbits and sidebars. The essential oil is not anti-inflammatory to a, a high degree. Um, if you want, uh, if you're really wanting a high amount of anti-inflammatory activity from ginger essential oil, you're going to want to use CO2 extract. It extracts better, um, it extracts more uh, high amounts of the anti-inflammatory constituents. Dosages as a tea, that's so funny, as a tea, meh. <laughs> better as a juice or a decoction. So a decoction is a cooked plant material extract. So you put your herb in a pot, you cover it, you cook it. Um, let's see. Uh, as a tincture, my favorite way of making ginger um, tincture is to juice the plant, freeze the juice, get all the leftover plant material out of the juicer and tincture that. And then don't ask me how I found this out. I just like was experimenting and doing all kind of silly stuff. And I discovered that this is my favorite way to make it. It, it, it makes an incredible ginger tincture. Um, so I take the spent mark from the juicer and I tincture that. And then I combine the frozen, like I thought, but I combine the frozen ginger juice with the tincture and I do 40% juice, 60% tincture. And it's amazing. A lot of times I'll also add 10% glycerin to help with stabilizing the um, essential oil in it, but it is so good. Um, as a glycerin based extract dot dried root. Um, you can also preserve the fresh juice with 50% glycerin. Um, as a salve, you're going to do dried root one to five. I think using um, ginger essential oil in salve is really effective. And I think, do, especially if, if you want anti-inflammatory, do CO2 extract. But um, Chuck says, could you use an actual juicer or food mill to get the oil? Um, yes, you can. That is why I like to juice it because it gets a higher amount of essential oil. Um, if you wanted to get essential oil like straight, as in like only essential oil, you would just get the juice, settle it out. And then um, it's called decanting where you pour off the top. You're not going to get an appreciable amount with like a couple ginger roots in a blender and then, or in a juicer, you're not going to get a large amount of essential oil. Um, that would take a, a lot. Um, but that is possible to like, you will be able to see a small sheen on the top of your juice. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Wild cherry. It's one of my favorites. Um, the reason I address coughs as a first aid um, thing is I, I just, I can't begin to tell you how many times I end up on a camping trip with Ren and we're in the middle of nowhere and she like wakes up in the middle of the night with the worst cough on the planet. And it would like, if I wasn't prepared for a cough, it would ruin the trip and we have to go on the next night. Um, there's nothing worse than just a cough all night. like it ruins, you can be sick and have a cough and like continue with your day unless you're not sleeping. 
Um, so having a cough suppressant in your bag is like something I just do. I have lobelia and I have wild cherry in my, in my, um, first aid kit because it's just crazy. Um, also luckily we have wild cherry just growing everywhere here in the South. Um, so, um, it's blooming now. It's leafing out now. One of the primary distinguishing characteristics of cherries is the smell. They smell like um, almonds. I was like avocados. <laughs> my brain, my brain had a fart. Um, so yeah, they smell like um, like almonds, and they have that. They smell like cyanide. Um, is that constituent? And so um, you smell it, you, it smells like cherry and you know, you've got what you've got. Cherry, plum, um, and peach are all interchangeable and they can all be used for their cyanide content. Cyanide is toxic in large doses. It's a cough suppressant in small doses. Um, and it's incredibly, it's amazing. I, I lean on wild cherry and peach for their ability to suppress overexcitation of nerve endings in lots of cases. And th so that's why I'm covering this plant right now, because I think it is one of the most important things to carry around with you um, because it has such wide applications. Um, but we've got a couple of varieties. We've got Prunus serratina, Prunus albamensis, Prunus caroliniana, uh, Prunus yedonensis, and then Prunus campin. The last two were introduced, they're decorative species. Um, parts used, so we use the bark. You can use the sap, you can use small twigs, but you use the inner bark. Um, it's a third degree remedy, so that means it is definitely medicine due to its cyanide content, but you are not going to keel over from taking it. It's additive and it has a pretty long half-life, which means that it metabolizes pretty slowly in the body. So that means that when we take it, um, uh, we get a little bit of cyanide buildup. And so if you take it every day, four times a day, larger doses for two weeks, you're going to start notice shortness of breath. And then you just stop taking it. It's not a huge deal. It works incredibly well um, as an antihistamine, as a cardiotonic. Um, it works in cases of um, obviously cough because it's suppressing nerve endings. So the way cyanide works, I love I love this plant. I just am like totally nerd out about wild cherry, but it actually slows the ability of your cells in your mitochondria to utilize oxygen. So the parts of your body that utilize oxygen most rapidly are your brain, your lungs, and your heart. Now, why would we want to slow the activity in our brain, our heart, or our lungs? Can you guys give me some examples and thoughts? Euler. I'm just kidding. Um, so overactivity of the mind is super common. I see this in um, when people have low GABA, uh, PMS, you can get hyperactivity of the brain um, in cases of histamine excess. So people have high histamine, they can get mental health issues from high histamines. Um, insomnia can be caused from high histamines. Anytime I see a lot of like almost, um, I want to be careful about using this word, but mania where like, there's sort of an obsessive thought pattern. Um, but there's not like a pathology where somebody literally has mania. Um, obviously there are things to explore with that and histamines could be a, a contributing factor, but, um, I'll say like, it personally shows up for me when my histamines are high and I'm PMSing. Um, and while cherry can just settle that out, I also figured out that wild cherry is really great when you've had too much coffee because coffee upregulates your 
your metabolism and you end up with neuro excitation and, you know, sweaty palms, heart rate increases and respiration rate increases. Well, all of that's incredibly uncomfortable. So if you have too much coffee, you can take wild cherry and it will slow all of that down and you'll have like your brain will take a sigh of relief. Your heart will stop pounding and your, um, your lungs will, your respiration rate will go down. Um, it's great in pregnancy where we see increase in metabolic rate where it can be kind of uncomfortable. Um, I lean on peach more for that because peach has lower amounts of cyanide. Um, but the reason it works for coughs is because it suppresses the overactivity and the excessive neurological firing that's caused when you have irritation and inflammation in the lungs causing excessive coughing. Now, you know, in your head, you might be like, why would you want to stop a cough from happening? Well, we want to decrease the amount of coughing and make it more productive. So if you've ever had a cough where it sounds like this, <laughs> your lungs are spasming and you're not able to actively actually cough anything out. That is not productive. It's just exhausting and it just wears the person out and they can't sleep and rest. What you want is to simultaneously astringe the tissue, get all of that stuff glommed together, suppress coughing to the point that it's going to cough like a productive cough where it'll be like, <laughs> and then you get this big glom of mucus up. You're like, yes, that's what you want. And then another cool thing about, um, while cherry is that um, it's it's expectorating astringent and suppresses excessive nerve firing in the lungs. So the reason it's the kingpin of cough is because it does all of those three things. It's simultaneously astringent, um, mucilage, a little bit mucilaginous, um, and uh, it suppresses cough reflex to a good extent, not a bad extent. Um, and it's, it's just, it's just perfect. So wild cherry is lovely. If you've never played with it, please do. Um, and, um, yeah, so you can make a fresh bark tincture one to three and 40% alcohol, a little bit lower proof glycerin based extract, fresh or dried bark. You're going to do a cold maceration. So you don't cook it because cooking it breaks down cyanide and you don't want to break down the primary constituent. As a syrup, you can make a strong cold infusion and then add 50% honey. Um, we talked about distinguishing characteristics, primarily that when you scratch it, it's scratch and sniff identification, highly underrated, but scratch it, sniff it, and then um, you're good to go. The Let's see. Um, like I said, you can use peach and plum interchangeably. Violet, who loves violet? It's so great. Um, violets are out right now. It's pretty ubiquitous. They're found everywhere. They're a common yard weed. They like it to be a little bit moist and cool and they like to be in little dips. Um, and they also like to be butted up against things quite often. You'll find them with companion plants of um, chickweed. They really like to be with chickweed. Uh, they will bloom twice a year, which is why, which is super handy. Um, and they're just, oof, they're just so sweet. So we've got a couple varieties, viola species, when you see viola species or vi or any botanical name where you've got genus and SPP, it means that they're referring to the entire genus. For the most part, you can use the whole genus of viola um, interchangeably for these uses. Um, primarily, I use bicolor and odorata because the varieties that grow in woodland areas and are uh, tend to be less prolific and um, and uh, some of them are in danger or at risk. If you're using bicolor or odorata, they're the ones that grow in the yard. They're the ones that grow in fields. Um, and um, so those are the ones I tend to use. I use medicinally the leaves and the flowers primarily. The roots are incredibly medicinal, but they're also very, um, they're a low dose botanical. So the roots are fourth degree remedy. 
the uh, flowers and the leaves are a first degree remedy. Um, let's see, the, they're cooling, they're a cooling plant. They have a really high affinity um, and use for the, the um, throat and the lymphatic system in the throat. Um, so if you have sore throat or they also work on the breast tissue, so lymph in the breast and in the throat, I tend to lean on violet a lot when I've got a sore throat, especially because I tend to get them when, with dehydration and when I get dry and because violet is incredibly moistening, it's very goopy. You can eat the leaves in a salad. They're very mucilaginous. You chew on them and then they turn to like chia seed consistency in your mouth. Um, they're anti-inflammatory because they're so cooling. They're demulcent, which means they're cooling and moistening and goopy. They're emollient, which is moistening, moistening, expectorant, mildly laxative and lymphatic. They are a very gentle lymphatic, but incredibly effective. Um, one use that I use it for that I don't, I, I don't hear it a lot. I don't know where I learned it, but it was a European indication. I think that I read it maybe in Culpepper, but um, I use violet flower glycerite for infant constipation. I love it in cases where, where the baby is transferring from breast milk to solid food and they all get constipated. It's incredible for that. So the reason the roots are a fourth degree remedy is because it has this constituent, I think it's rutin, um, that is an explosive cathartic. So you will run to the toilet. It is, is very strong laxative. That same constituent is found in really, 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 really tiny amounts in the flowers. And so it's incredibly effective for infants and infant constipation. It's gentle at that dosage. You do one to two droppers full of glycerin based extract. And, um, and then the babies um, will just use the bathroom in about four hours. So I used it with Ren. She loved it. And um, it tastes great. You don't have to fight them. Um, they love it. And it's just, it's lovely. It's a lovely extract. I love making violet flower glycerite. It's my, one of my favorite things. Um, it's just, a, it's a lovely experience. It smells great. You're in the grass. It's cool. Um, you're gathering all these little flowers. They make a great color when you're glycerin based extract. It's kind of this gray purple. Um, it's just magical. Um, I like making a tincture and or glycerin based extract of the flowers. And then I do a separate extract of the leaves. I like doing fresh leaf um, in 95% alcohol, dried leaf in 60% alcohol. Um, and it does make a lovely salve and works incredibly well for breast tissue. Um, and as a topical, um, lymphatic, I like combining violet and poke together. Poke is an incredibly strong plant and it is a really strong lymphatic. It's like, it's like a lymphatic rotor rooter. Violet tempers it and chills it out and makes it a little bit less harsh. So poke is very hot and like masculine and pointed and just like severe. And violet is very gentle and soft and loving and like calming. And so when you combine the two, it kind of chills out poke and makes it a little less severe and, um, and, and allows them to work well together. You can do half and half um, and then do small doses of that. Um, I, I will often do like 75% poke, um, 25% violet, and then dose accordingly. But I'm a practitioner. You guys would probably want to do just half and half and do a couple drops of poke violet tincture, um, maybe uh, four drops maximum. Um, harvest it now. Make a salad of it. I, had, I did have a client... Um, once a friend call and say, hey, we positively ID this violet. We're going to eat it for dinner. I positively ID it. Everything's good. They call me back a couple hours later and everyone in the family had violet uh, leaves for dinner in their um, in their stir fry. 
everybody was fine in the family except for dad and dad had explosive diarrhea and he's like what happened and i'm like oh you must be really sensitive to well first the first question is did you harvest any roots because i told you not to and he's like no we were really careful like okay so then um he actually was just incredibly sensitive to the rutin in um in the violet and so so just be aware do small amounts of the leaves if you're going to eat them and then make sure that that you don't you aren't the person that responds really severely to um <laughs> to the violet leaves uh for dinner <laughs> which a clean out every once in a while is not such a bad thing oh i love violet for grief violet flower in particular drop doses just give it to somebody in their pocket um I, anytime somebody's grieving or has a loss, I send them violet flower glycerin. Um, and I just give it to them in a little teeny little bottle and I tell them to carry it around with them. And when they're overcome with grief, just to take a little bit of it. Um, it really helps to temper grief. It helps to make it a little bit more palatable, a little bit more easy to process and digest. And it just softens it. And it helps us feel kind of taken care of in our grief. Um, and makes us feel like we're not grieving alone, which is often what makes grief so difficult. Um, so yeah. Questions about Violet? No? How you guys doing? Get some thumbs up. Let's see. What's the indication for poke Violet? Polly, could you rephrase that question? Um, to make tea, do you dry the flowers? You can dry the flowers. Um, I don't think that violet flower tea is that good. Like, I think if it, I really love doing, um, violet flower glycerin based extract. Um, when would you use poke in combination? Honestly, all the time. Very few people really need like poke by itself. It's just so warming and so severe. You pretty much could just have poke violet combo in your apothecary and not have poke by itself. Um, but in particular, I think you would possibly use, if I was going to give you a specific indication, it would be in people that are um, not so, uh, that are, that are hot. If somebody is really hot in their constitution and they're already very severe and warm and inflamed, then doing a little bit of violet in there can be really important. Um, and you'll get probably much better results. Okay. This is Usnia. Is anybody familiar with Usnia? Yeah, so um, it's often confused with reindeer moss, which grows on the ground. They're both lichens. Lichens are symbiotic relationships between bacteria and um, cyanobacteria and uh, like in um, fungus um, or algae and fungus. Um, it, uh, it can grow, it grows on trees. It grows on rotting wood. It helps to degrade wood. Um, you are going to find usnea on fallen branches. That's pretty much um, out west where it's more moist. You will find it on tree trunks readily, like in this picture. Here in the south, you find it more on um, branches. And often you're going to find it after a storm, a bunch of branches will have fallen and you'll find usnea on those branches. Um, I use usnea, um, primarily as a systemic anti-infective. It is anti-infective against, uh, and when I say anti-infective, so there's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. When somebody says anti-infective, they mean all three, unless they don't know what they're talking about and they're just being vague. Um, so um in particular usnea has been really well studied 
against at least 16 strains of gram positive bacteria, in K, including strep and staph. Um, it's effective against E. coli. Um, they are, it does go systemic. So it gets into the bloodstream and will go anywhere, which is when you're working with anti-infective herbs, that's really important to know. Um, a lot of times, uh, it, herbs will only be anti-infective to what they can touch. So some herbs don't go past the lining of our gut. Some herbs won't go into the liver, won't go into the soft tissue and the sinuses. Like you have to put them where they're going. So if an herb is metabolized and doesn't even get into the liver, it's just getting into the gut and it's anti-infective in the gut, great, we'll use it in the gut. But if it's in, if it's an anti-infective topically, great. We'll use it in the sinuses as a neti pot rinse. If you take an herb that cannot be metabolized past the gut barrier into the body, into the liver, into the bloodstream, it will not get where it's going and it will not do a thing. So usnea is interesting in that it is a systemic anti-infective. It will grow, go into liver metabolism, into the whole body. Um, it's incredibly effective. They were using it and researching it at, in World War One as an anti-infective, and then they discovered penicillin, and then it kind of got research, kind of got um, pushed to the wayside. But there's a lot of pretty solid research before um, and during World War One um, using usnea as an anti-infective. Um, and this, this is where I go. Uh, so the two things I use it for most commonly are uh, topical skin infections, really bad skin infections. Like I've used it in um, a couple cases of uh, wounds that won't heal, st topical staff wounds, boils. Um, I use it in sore throats because it's really an anti, you tend to get um, sore throats can be st strep. Um, and then commonly E. coli, and then also UTIs can be strep or E. coli. So um, that's when I use them is in UTIs, sore throats, and really severe topical infections. Now, this is where I'm going to get on my normal soapbox. <laughs> People love to say that herbs are either like ineffective and don't work and, or they're incredibly safe or they work so well and they work better than pharmaceuticals and they're the only things we should be using and they will heal us and they'll never hurt us. You know, it's either they'll never hurt us. They can't harm you and they're completely ineffective or they can kill you and, uh, and they don't work. <laughs> It's this like weird dichotomy. Here's the deal. Usnea is toxic to the liver. It has caused very well-documented cases of liver damage and liver failure. Herbs are simultaneously effective and sometimes ineffective. Most Often when people don't use correct dosages, they don't use them for a, appropriate amounts of time, or they're not using them in a method that actually works. So kind of like what we were talking about, if an herb can't touch it, um, if it's an anti-infective herb, but it only works on things it can touch, then it's not going to do anything for your UTI because it's not going to be metabolized to even get to the UTI to, to work on it. If, so there are plenty of herbs that are damaging to us. Just like Advil can hurt you, Usnea can hurt you. That doesn't mean that they're ineffective. It doesn't mean we shouldn't use them. Um, herbs are effective if used properly and safe if used properly, just like any other form of medical intervention. Um, so use herbs safely. Don't use Usnea in cases of liver toxicity and failure. Don't use usnea for long term. It works amazingly well in the short term, three days, high dose, 
um, you're going to be doing somewhere in the ballpark of a teaspoon of tincture every two to three hours with a UTI. I like doing a tea with corn silk and usnea. My daughter had a UTI. We were um, on the Snake River in Idaho, like two hours away from the nearest grocery store um, and no health food store at all. Uh, we thank God we're having corn for one of our meals and I had corn silk and I, there was usnea all over the trees. I made her usnea, um, corn silk tea. She drank that for two days and no more UTI. Um, I don't use usnea long-term. I don't use it in people with liver issues. Um, and I use it copiously and freely in topical infections. I like using it as a rinse. Thoughts, questions, concerns? Dosage for tincture. Uh, tincture is going to be um, tea, uh, one teaspoon. Um, in cases of UTIs and sore throats, I like to do a spray in the throat. So like the spray, I do like two pumps every 20 minutes to an hour. Um, I mostly just have people put it in their pocket so that they're touching, like getting the herb on the infection. With UTIs, I do about um, a teaspoon to a tablespoon of tincture um, every two to four hours. Um, and then, um, yeah. Thanks for that question. Last herb. <laughs> Whoops, there's a mistake. This is calendula flowers not chamomile flowers. <laughs> um, but I'll fix that later. <laughs> um, so chamomile. I love chamomile. I think it's a highly underrated plant. I think it's highly underrated because oftentimes it is used for children and it is thought of as a children's herb and people don't dose it appropriately. You need a lot of chamomile to do any good. Um, it will work just fine, like two tea bags worth. But if you really want to knock yourself out, do like four. Um, buy loose leaf chamomile and then weigh it and do 15 grams to one quart of water. Um, I love chamomile as a gentle insomnia aid for people that um, have a hard time surrendering to sleep. They're wound up they don't like to be forced into sleep and they have what I call a reactive hypervigilance. So uh, sometimes people's nervous systems, when they're forced to relax through harder herbalism, like things like valerian, things that are a little more forcible, their body will be like, I don't want to relax. You're trying to make me relax. I'm going to reactively respond to this and pump out some cortisol. And now I'm going to stay awake all night long. Um, so anybody that really struggles with kind of that over excitation of the nervous system, that kind of stubbornness of the nervous system and just hyper, hyper arousal, hyperactivity at night where they have a hard time relaxing and chilling out, starting chamomile tea at dinner and then drinking it all night until they're just exhausted. And at, by nine, you're asleep, like do appropriate dosages make sure you're doing 15 grams to one quart. Um, I think a cold infusion works really in a, uh, works really well. Um, I also really love chamomile in high doses as a, it's a great gastric anti-inflammatory. Um, and it's really specifically indicated for irritability and grumpiness, um, just fussiness in people of any age. So if you've got a baby that's just pissed for no reason, they're not hungry, they're not tired, they're just mad. Um, in, uh, you know, anytime somebody is just kind of being a baby um, and they're just grumpy, like sometimes they'll just wake up mad, irritable. Um, it's, it's perfect. Chamomile is the perfect remedy for that. Um, I think it's amazing for hyperactivity, 
teething fussiness. Some of the reason chamomile gets sold short as just a children's herb is because it's so perfect for babies. It's great for colic. It's great for uh, fighting sleep. It's, it's an anti-inflammatory. So it's good for teething. It's good for fevers. Um, it's good, a bit good for irritability. It's just, it's one of those, it's a plant that's perfect for infants and children. Um, and so I think people kind of get laser focused vision on that. Um, but, uh, one second, my daughter's here. Hey baby. I'm still teaching. Um, when the arrow is crossed, you push this one. Okay. The one over there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love you. I'll see you in a little while. I'm almost done. Shut the door for me. Um, where am I? Okay. Uh, got some questions. Dosage. Let's see. How do you make a cold infusion? You put 15 grams of herb in a quart jar. You pour cool water over it up to one quart. And then you put the lid on it and put it in the refrigerator. It helps if you mix it. Just agitate it after you've got the lid on. Um, also, I really love chamomile hydrosol, which is hydrosol. If you think about rose water, it's the same thing um, as a hydrosol. <clears throat> Hydrosols are made um, when um, is a byproduct of making essential oils. So a hydrosol is basically an uh, it does have some essential oil content, but it has a lot more tan more acids in it. Um, and I can't get get all into it. But one of my favorite things to do with Ren when she was a baby and she would have fevers is just spray her down with chamomile hydrosol. It's also really lovely for sunburns. Um, so. Mental note, chamomile hydrosol is just lovely. Um, take homes for chamomile, it's antispasmodic. Oh my God, it's so good as an essential oil for tension headaches. I love it for tension headaches. I love it for um, musculoskeletal trauma. So bruises um, and spasmodic muscles. It's great for cramps. Uh, I do really love it for PMS. It's cooling. Um, it's anti-spasmodic, it's anti-infect, or um, and, yeah, anti-spasmodic, carminative, like all the things that you also struggle with in PMS. Um, and it's great as a gastric anti-inflammatory. So a lot of times I'll pair it with plantain um, for gut inflammation, IBS, um, and gut irritation. So it's cooling, anti-inflammatory, and um it's, it's great for gas. So I use it a lot in teas for, um, gut issues. I really like pairing it with elderflower, peppermint, and yarrow. Those are some of the, um, herbs that, that go really well with it. So awesome. Do you have questions about chamomile? Cool. Okay. So let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, wow. I've already talked for an hour. Goodness. Okay. We'll go kind of fast. So infusions, um, some important things to know. So herbal infusions are just when you pour hot water over herb, that's an infusion. A and one thing to always note about, um, one thing to think about, um, herbal infusions is you always want to put the lid on top of your infusion. So you're not losing essential oil content, mm -hmm. a decoction. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I can't help you right now, but I will be done in just a moment. Could you play and with blocks in your is, room? Is that the way to turn it back? I can't help you right now with that. Okay. I love okay. you. Please go to your room. I think so. Yes. Please try it on your own and I'll help you when I'm done. Okay. Please play with kinetic blocks in your room. I want to. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Good idea. Um, a decoction is when a plant material is cooked. Uh, so you also want to cover that. So a lot of times you'll cook the plant material for 20 minutes. 
the harder the plant material is. So if you're doing flowers, you're not, not going to cook it. If you're doing bark or seeds, anything that I generally say to my students, anything that when you drop it in the pan on a metal pan, it tinks, then it's solid enough and hard enough for you to make a decoction with. Creating poultices and complexes. Poultices are ground up plant material slapped on. Compresses are when you cook plant material and you wet your cloth. I can't do that. I can't have a conversation right now, sweetie. One more. Okay, hurry. One. How do you get? How do you get to another one? I cannot help you with that right now. Okay. Oh, Please go eat do. dinner or play with blocks in your room. I'm oh, done. Have play. I'm done talking. Okay, you decide what to do, but I can't have any more conversations. Um. <laughs> so compresses. Um. So cook the plant material and then put it on, um, uh, cook the plant material, get a cloth, dip it in the, in the plant material and the tea, and then put it on the uh, wound. Great for infections, great for really serious wounds. I love soaks and soaking puncture wounds and sprains, strains, anything that's infected. I love doing um, Epsom salts. Um, so any of those things. Properly preparing and administering herbal remedies. We've kind of talked about the importance of dosage, frequency, and then knowing how a plant is metabolized so that you're utilizing it properly. Putting it up your nose, if it's an, a topical anti-infective, great idea. Um, if it's a systemic anti-infective, you can take it orally. That's great. Um, and then always be careful and cautious about um, utilizing herbal remedies. I had a, a student message me um, not long ago and was like, I'm, I broke my ankle or foot and I'm making Arnica tea. And I was like, no, no. Don't. So um, Arnica is really not safe to take internally. Um, and we think like Arnica, it's in the grocery store. It's fine. I can buy the tea readily. It's safe. It's an herb, but it's safe topically. It's very not safe orally and will give you heart palpitations and degrade your intestinal lining and give you stomach ulcers really fast. Um, so, um, you know, just recognize that um, you you can't always just think of herbs as completely safe. They're not. Um, and you need to be aware that there are contraindications. And if you're taking something regularly and consistently, that's when you see not need to start being more cautious and careful about contraindications. If you take something one time, it's not going to con be contraindicated with your, um, with your meds. Um, let's see how much chamomile is safe for pregnancy and postpartum as much as you want. Um, totally fine. Herbal first aid kits. So let's talk about that. So herbal first aid kits. Um, I am very much pro put whatever you want in your first aid kit for you. Like don't go off of some list off the internet, write down, um, Mommy, our food is spicy. okay. I'm sorry. Can you drink some milk with it? Hungry. Okay, eat it and then drink water and drink milk. I'll be there in just a moment. I'm almost done. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, so we struggle with cold sores, um, Ren Malay. You can sit with me while I finish teaching or you can play in your room. No. Can I don't listen to stories? Um, guys, I have to go get her a, a movie or I'm not going to be able to finish. So just go get a snack and take a potty break.
It might be a little scary. You like a little scary? Okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, so let's see. Um, like I was saying before, we have, I have a cough remedy. So this is cough away. This is a formulation I use, I make. Um, I used to have a product line. Um, and so these are like labels and recipes from that product line. But anyway, cough away. Um, I have hormonal, um, like mood swing stuff for PMS. So I call this one cray cray away. Um, I get a lot of tension headaches. That's something I really struggle with. Um, and so I made a CBD bye-bye tension headache formula. Um, so this has things like blue vervain, passion flower, um, pulsatilla, which is a low-dose botanical, lavender, and some CBD with fever few, and stakey sufficient alice, which is wood betony. Um, I have usnea for UTIs in my kit. Um, another thing that I regularly have struggle with is um, uh, muscle tightness in my neck before the tension headaches. So I always carry lobelia. This is a well-loved bottle. Lobelia for topical application for um, sore muscles. So um, I have traveler's bitters, which is a digestive bitter, which helps stimulate sluggish digestion. Um, and it this one in particular, I formulated for for traveling. Um, and so I, you know, this is my to go in my car kit. So if I feel like I got food poisoning or if I'm in a foreign country, I had a friend that I sent like a care kit. She was going to, um, where was it? Like Thailand. And so she took this every day, three times a day before every meal. And she never got any, um, Montezuma's revenge or anything like that. I have children's allergy formula with us, with me, and a cold and flu formula um, for Wren. I have a low-dose botanical called Gelsimium, which has a crazy label, but it says toxic um, for pain. Um, I have anti-inflammatory that I make. Um, and so kind of what I recommend is sitting down and writing each person in your family's name down and then what they struggle with and then figure out what formulations will work across the board for everybody um, and just make sure that you have those things in your first aid kit. I highly recommend um, uh, finding a local herbalist to buy formulations from. Um, uh, I worked at Herb Farm, the tincture company. So that's a great option. They are really lovely people. Um, I, uh, I highly recommend that. But yeah, like just think about the things that you guys always get. Um, and this is my kit from us from years of kind of knowing. I always get sore throat. So I always have sore throat spray. Um, and I have different kits for different things. Like I have a teaching kit. So in my teaching kit, I have chapstick and throat coat tea and I have cough drops and I have um, like brain aids in case I like am super tired or um, I have chocolate in there. I have coffee in there. I have um, Shizandra, which really helps with mental stimulation. I have um, a formula called Brain Boost, which has a lot of sage and rosemary and saffron for cerebral circulation. So I know that I'm on like the, 
the professional end of things. So it's easy for me to just think and kind of ramble off ideas and thoughts, but start with what do y'all struggle with? And then work on, okay, what herbs can we use? What are the primary herbs that would be good for this issue or condition? And, or what are the herbs that are around in our neighborhood that we can use for that? So a lot of the plants that we covered tonight are going to cover a lot of those issues. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, and that's the end of class. I wanted to share with you guys a little bit um, about how you could learn more from me if you've enjoyed this class. Um, I have a monthly subscription program. Every time that I would teach classes, people, especially plant walks, people would in the plant walk and they would be like, um, you know, oh my God, I loved class. It was so cool. It was so interesting. And I learned so much, but also I feel so unprepared and nervous about harvesting something from my backyard and then making medicine and then using it. Like, how do I even like the task of learning an herb? Well, just feels monumental and like also incredibly difficult to like stay organized and focused. And so I kind of realized I needed to create a structure for students to be able to do that in a way that's a little bit easier. So I started the Herbal Medicine Monthly Subscription. We focus on one plant per month. And what's really neat about this program that's different from a lot of the ones um, on the internet is that I ship you a kit. So I make you, like this past month we did chamomile. I made chamomile solid extract. I made chamomile tincture and I sent chamomile tea. And everyone in the class learns about the plant. I do in-depth monographs on how to grow it, how to harvest it, how to find it in the wild if it's there. Um, uh, you know, anything that you'd want to know on how to grow it, forage it, harvest it, what to do with it after, how to make tincture, tea, glycerite, um, all of the medicinal uses and its properties in depth, my clinical uses and experiences. And my goal being that I take all the guesswork out of it. I share information from my personal experience and my 14 years of clinic work and also my BS meter. I can, I can read an article and research and know whether that stands up and holds up to the test of time. It's really hard as a beginner to search the internet for herbal information. And then there's somebody just spouting off a repeated, you know, clickbaity version of this information on this herb. Well, I've lived it. I've used it. I've made it. And I've used it clinically with hundreds of people. So like it's, it's the best way that I could get information to people in a way that I felt like they could really learn a plant because they're being, they're able to taste it and feel it, learn about it in depth and then start using it because they're so comfortable because I've taken it with them. I have given them any type of all of the information they need from safety to uses and all of that, um, all of that information. And so, um, I want to just point you guys in that direction. If you're interested, I'm going to give you guys a link if I can find it. Um, here's the order page, which doesn't do us a lot of good, but, um, so here's this program. That's the order page. I'm sorry. I should have had this. Um, so that program is every single month. You can sign up for it. It's no commitment. You can do just the digital online version, or you can do the, um, uh, the online version and the kit, which I highly recommend. Um, I'm opening up 60 spots for that. I already have 60 people enrolled in that program. Um, and, um, it's, it's just an amazing program. If you're super interested in making medicine, so this is the cool stuff that's in the first program, the Herbal Medicine Monthly Subscription. So I do an in-depth monograph. I do identification videos. I do a live monthly class where you can ask me questions. And then this was an example of the red clover kit and tincture and salve from a uh, one of the plants that we covered. The next program that I offer is the in-person foraging and medicine making intensive. I teach it 
one uh, twice a year. This I'm actively um, enrolling for the July course. I already have five people. I only have 25 spots um, and I have five people and I haven't even advertised for this program at all. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in really taking um, a course in how to forage in person and learn how to make everything. I teach you how to how to make a proper tea. I teach you how to extract um, things in tincture form, in glycerite um, form, in salve. We learn the biochemical aspects of things. We learn the phytopharmacology. We learn how to know how to extract a plant most effectively. I basically turn you into a, a kitchen expert kitchen herbalist. Um, and we cover, um, so we, by the end of the course, you're going to have knowledge to make over 20 preparations. Uh, these, this is a plant walk that we did. We do a plant walk every weekend that we meet, uh, by the end of class, people have an insane amount of preparations. Um, so this is just one day of one of the classes. We made a facial oil, a solid perfume. I have no idea what we made there a muscle rub, and then a nausea, which is a sinus, um, a sinus uh, oil-based preparation for, it's an anti-infective. I teach you for about 48 hours. Um, it's four weekends per month. Um, I have been honing this course material and I've taught this program, I'm going to say like 12 times. Um, I, it's about 250 pages of course material and I've been teaching it for 10 years. Um, so if you're interested in that program, I'm going to put the link down there. Um, this one's a little bit more of a, of an investment, um, but I always do scholar. I do offer scholarships. Um, I also offer, um, uh, um, yeah, so I offer scholarships and payment plans. The subscription is definitely geared towards people that, um, don't have a lot of time, um, uh, want to do a little bit less of a financial commitment and then really want to invest in themselves every month. And then they also are investing in an apothecary for their household. So every month you're going to get plant material and, um, the kit. If, um, you know, the, the foraging and medicine making course is a lot more, it's hands-on, um, and it's more about making medicine than it is about focusing on the medicinal properties of each plant. So both programs go really well together. A lot of my students do the, the forging and medicine making intensive and then do the subscription program. Um, and so it's just a great way to um, simultaneously work on your herbal um, prowess every single month, build your herbal first aid kit. And then also, you know, you can take the forging and medicine making course and learn how to make um, everything that you would want to know how to make. So everyone has the link in the link in the, um, the chat. And I <laughs> thanks so much. Oh, somebody said something sweet. This is the best zoom you've ever attended. Oh, thanks, Caitlin. Um, yeah. So y'all please keep in touch, sign up for my newsletter on my website. Um, I don't spam you and then follow me on social media. And, um, you know, if you, uh, please, you know, I do webinars once a month, so tap into those. And, um, you know, I also do plant walks once a month. So if you're local, then please, you know, come, come see, I, you, everyone will get a recording of this and the slides tomorrow, um, in an email, Double check and make sure that you your email, my emails to you are not going to spam because that is kind of common. So thanks everyone so much. I'll be here for a couple more minutes if anybody has any more questions. And um, like I said, the subscription is open. I only have 60 spots I'm offering and um, the forging and medicine making course in, is uh, intensive um, uh, is also open and I have 20 spots left. So, uh, do herb tinctures ever expire? Yes, they do. Um, they do expire. T 
tinctures with higher proof alcohol can last up to seven to 10 years. Glycerin based extracts tend to be best refrigerated for two. The lower the alcohol content in the tincture, the, um, the shorter the shelf life. I hope that helped. I'm sorry. Thank you for asking that twice. Cause I'm realizing you asked that, um, asked that, uh, earlier. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And, um, I just had such a lovely time. Thanks for joining me. And next month I'll be doing another webinar. So I hope you can make it. Thanks everyone. Have a great night.